Well, before I get going with today's message, I just want to say how blessed I am to be able to be a pastor at this church. As I heard a lot of you know the scripture, you're able to fill in all the gaps along the way in that passage. It's really good to see. I think it's fitting this morning that we're going to talk about God's sovereign hand at work through history. As we heard during the prayer time, there's a lot of there's a lot of heaviness that we go through in life and a lot of hardships. It's always good to be reminded that God's still in control. We also got to sing happy birthday to Anna, one of our beloved members, and also a reminder that some of us have a little more history than others. And I know Anna has a lot of great stories. I encourage you all to maybe have a cup of tea with Abe and Anna sometime and familiarize yourselves with their stories and their past because I've really enjoyed getting to know them and hear their stories. I love stories. In particular, I love to read books. I love to read stories in books, especially a book with a good story. Good characters are important, but the thing I really like is the story. I love to watch how it unfolds and develops. There's a real craft to storytelling, to introduce the main conflict because, yes, there's always a conflict, and you can see how they slowly advance it over time. A good storyteller is able to call back to certain past events, to remind you of what had happened in the past, how it relates to what's presently going on, and bringing it all to a close in the climax. That part of the story where everything you had been reading, all that the author has been weaving together throughout their narrative. The climax is that point where you see the conflict resolved. And a good writer will keep you on the edge of your seat right until the last moment. And this is what we see in scripture. It's a story that took thousands of years to unfold. It starts at the creation of all things then we learn more about God and his interactions with humanity. We see glimpses and foreshadowings of what's to come, about the Son of God coming to redeem his people, how he would suffer, die, and rise from the dead. But the story doesn't end there. We're even told how history will end. That's right, history, because the Bible is not a fictitious tale. It's factual history, and it's told in the most dramatic fashion. This is what Paul's trying to drive home to his audience. It's a beautiful picture of God's hand at work. It challenges the way that the proud Israelite interprets their history. Because Paul is showing how this is the story of God, not the story of Israel. And much like our New Testament books, it leaves us with a warning of future events to come. Beware. This is a great passage because it shows how God's story is received differently by different types of people. For some people, it doesn't matter how good the story is. It doesn't even matter if the story is true. The hearers will not always respond with joy. Sometimes they even respond with hate. Today we're going to explore all that God is doing through these apostles, through history, and in his church. Let's open with prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can trust in you, God. We know who you are. You've revealed your character, your nature to us, God. Ultimately, you've shown us your love by sending Christ to die in our place. And we pray that as we read this portion of scripture today, God, you would open our eyes to learn more about you and to be able to continue on in that faith, even when times are tough. Amen. This passage opens up with an interesting event. John Mark leaves Paul and Barnabas. Here, when they set shore at Perga, we hear that he leaves them. We aren't given any specific explanation as why he left, but we do know that Paul viewed John Mark as a deserter. Later, in chapter 15, we learn, now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take one with them who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia who had not gone on with him to do the work. We get the sense that Paul didn't care for the fact that John Mark didn't continue on with him. He didn't go on to do the work of evangelizing in this region. Scholars have speculated as to why John Mark left. Many agree, myself included, that it is likely John Mark resents the fact that Paul is becoming more prominent than Barnabas. Verse, our text even implies this. Verse 13 opens by saying, Paul and his companions set sail. Barnabas and John Mark aren't even mentioned. Paul and his companions. Until now, 
Barnabas has been mentioned first. This showed a place of prominence in ancient writing. Barnabas was the leader up until this point. And just prior to this, Paul had taken a leadership role by rebuking Bar-Jesus. This might not have sat well with John Mark. After all, Barnabas was his cousin. Who does this Paul character think he is? Why doesn't he wait for Barnabas to lead? If this were the reason that he left Paul and Barnabas, it would make sense that Paul would view John Mark as a deserter. After all, Paul was only following the Holy Spirit in all that he said and did. This leadership change was a result of God's plan, not his. We will read more about this conflict in the coming weeks, once we get on to chapter 15. But for now, we can see that Paul and Barnabas continue on. They press on to share the gospel in Antioch. This is a different Antioch than the one we read about in chapter 11. That Antioch was in Syria, but this Antioch is in Galatia. They were often places with the same name. This is similar to how Canada has a Selkirk in Manitoba and a Selkirk in Ontario. When they arrive, they go to the synagogue. This was their custom, to bring the gospel to the synagogue first. We learn in verse 43 that there were Jews and devout converts to Judaism, meaning God-fearers and proselytes. Proselytes were Gentiles that became Jews through submitting themselves to their religious customs. After the scripture reading is done, the synagogue leader gives the people an invitation to speak. If anyone has a word of encouragement for the people, say it. And Paul jumps at this opportunity. He addresses them as men of Israel and those who fear God. The men of Israel are the Jews, but those who fear God would be referring to the Gentiles who were gathered. This is similar to Cornelius, who was called a God-fearer. He sought after God, but he was uncircumcised. He wasn't a full proselyte. And these are the people who are gathered. Paul's message starts by saying, in verse 17, The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. The God of this people, he is your God, Israel. And Paul shows how God's sovereign hand was at work. He chose our fathers. The fathers didn't earn God, he chose them. And God made Israel great. He made them great during their time in Egypt. And he did this by making them great in numbers. So Paul is beginning to make the point that God was unfolding his plan. Israel's might and strength isn't the story of their history. It's God's hand at work, his power. And it was by his arm that he led the people out of Egypt. God had sent plagues to frustrate Pharaoh to make him send the Israelites out of captivity. And God ultimately rescued them by drowning their army in the sea. In this one verse alone, we see the story of God at work through choosing, blessing, and saving Israel. God chose them. God made them great. God led them out. God, God, God. It's emphasizing God is the main character, the one who does things. There's no attempt to appeal to Israel as being strong or being righteous. This is all planned and carried out by God. Not only is God the one who did all these amazing things, choosing them, blessing them, and saving them, Paul says, God put up with them. <laughs> Isn't that a glowing description of Israel? How many of us would like it if our parents said that about us? Johnny, what do I think about him? Well, I put up with him. Doesn't sound so good, does it? Paul is really working at humbling these Jews. He's stripping them of their pride and their heritage. He's saying that Israel was far from being per people who were worth saving. God had to put up with their grumbling and complaining. He had to put up with their rebellious spirit. Here Paul is actually laying the foundation for the gospel. He's helping to humble them. He's helping to show the glory of God. Salvation has always been a work of God, not a work of man. Man has always been in need of God's grace, even Israel. When Paul tells them that God had to put up with Israel, this is another way of saying that God showed Israel grace. He put up with them. This gives us a whole new level of appreciation for God's grace. We aren't the easiest people to love. God has every right to punish us, and we have no right to salvation. 
if it were based on our worthiness. God does not love us because we're awesome. God loves us because he's awesome. Paul then goes on to talk about how God destroyed the other nations. He gave them this land as their inheritance. God is still the one who's doing all these things. And here we see the precursor to the gospel. You see, the promised land is talked about in the New Testament as a picture of eternal life, our inheritance, our final rest. So this is important for them to understand. Israel was brought by God into the promised land because God always fulfills his promises. Paul is going to go on to share other promises that God has made. But there is more things that Paul wants these people to see before reaching his conclusion. Verse 21, Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Here again, we see God is the main actor. He's the mover and the shaker. Israel asked for a king, so God gave them Saul. He gave them what they asked for. Saul was a man after the people's hearts. He was mighty. He was a man of stature. He looked like a leader, but he relied on himself. This was Saul's downfall. And at this point in history, when Paul is speaking to them, this was Israel's downfall. They're relying on their righteousness, on their heritage. But they have been drifting away from a love for God. But Paul continues, God removes King Saul, and he replaced Saul with David, a man after God's own heart. Somebody who would do all his will. This was the kind of king that God chose for Israel, a man who seeks wisdom from God. Even in his failures, David still listened to the word of God. He was a man after God's heart. David sought to follow God's plans, and he repented with tears when he sinned against God. This was the kind of person God was looking for. Verse 23. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, just as he promised. God brought Israel their Savior. It was all part of his plan. He had made promises that he would send them a deliverer, a Messiah. There were prophecies dating back to the time of Moses that God would spend, send them his spokesperson to speak his words and to save his people. Jesus was their Savior sent from God. He was from the same lineage as King David, just like the prophecies said they would be. God's promise has been fulfilled in Jesus. When Paul further expounds his message, he talks about John the Baptist. This might seem necessary to include at this point. After all, he just told them about Jesus. Why work backwards? Why go back to bring in John the Baptist? The reason Paul brings John in is because of the words that John said. They really drive home the point that Paul is going to make later on the next Sabbath. In verse 25, we read that John said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Consider what we've seen until now. There's actually a theme of displacement. God's choice always displaces someone else. When God chose Israel, he displaced the other nations. And Saul was displaced by God's choice, King David. And here we see John the Baptist is displaced by Jesus. They were displaced and not replaced because God had a plan for them. We know that the Old Testament writings have much to say about God's plans for all of the nations. It's true that Saul was removed from his position based on his lack of faith, but John the Baptist was displaced because someone greater than he had arrived. John stepped aside to make way for God's promised deliverer. The message Paul is leaving them is, your position is not your possession. There is a greater plan that is unfolding. You need to get on board, or not, but either way, God is going to fulfill his promise. Verse 26, Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. He calls them brothers because they share the same heritage. They're part of the family of Abraham. And this message is for them, 
Paul extends this message beyond the children of Abraham, beyond the Jews only. He says, and those among you who fear God. It doesn't matter if you aren't a Jew. This message is for all people, of all nations. God sent all of this, this message of this salvation. And Paul addresses the religious Jews in Jerusalem. This message of salvation is for them as well. Verse 27, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him. Let's stop right there. They didn't recognize him. They didn't accept Jesus as their own Messiah. John, it says, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. This is a condemnation. What Paul says to them next is dripping with irony. They did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning them. They were getting together and reading these prophecies every single Sabbath. And they didn't even understand what the prophets were saying. Even though they were devoting their lives to the studying of Scripture, they missed the truth about God in the flesh coming down to be the worthy sacrifice. They didn't understand the message of the cross. And the worst condemnation of all was that they fulfilled the prophecies. They sent Jesus to the cross. Those men who were supposed to be leading God's people, the religious leaders, they had Jesus arrested. And those who were in the crowds, who claimed to be appalled at the blasphemy of Jesus, they cried, crucify him, crucify him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. He wasn't worthy of death. Jesus wasn't worthy of death. No, he was worthy of much more than that. Jesus is worthy of all glory, honor, and power. But they found him guilty of death, even though they found no guilt in him. In spite of all this, they executed the Son of God. They carried out the prophecies. They took him down from the tree, and they laid him in the tomb. But God, but God raised him from the dead. In spite of the horror of what has been done, God was still in control. When the religious leaders thought that they had ended this Jesus movement, when they thought they could get back to normal, God showed up and he raised Jesus. And Jesus made sure to show himself to people. His disciples and over 500 witnesses saw the resurrected Christ. And this is why this new movement, this church, has been spreading out from Jerusalem because people knew for a fact that Jesus was alive. And that meant he truly was the Messiah. All that Jesus said and did were in accordance with God's plan. Salvation was possible through faith in him. Paul shares some Old Testament prophecies to prove this point. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Jesus was God's son. He was literally begotten by God. This prophecy was from Psalm 2, which was about God's son being the one to inherit the nations. And Psalm 2 ends with a promise that those who take refuge in him they will be blessed. And Paul quotes two more passages. These show how Jesus was the one who they was written about. He was the holy one that David wrote about. Because David died. In this sense, he saw corruption. His body decayed. But Jesus did not decay because his body was raised from the dead. It's important for them to know that there's joy in prophecy as well. Paul had already said that they fulfilled prophecy by condemning Jesus to death. This would weigh on many of the hearers. But here, Paul leaves them hope. There were witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, the resurrection foretold in Scripture. He drives home his message in verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Brothers, I bring you good news. There's forgiveness of sins through the man Jesus. This salvation that he brings, it's freedom from our guilt, freedom from all the ways that we fall short. Under the law, we were all unworthy, but Jesus lived the sinless life. He died the death we deserve. He is willing to offer us forgiveness because he is worthy. What a great message. After learning about Israel's failure in the Exodus, how their people sentenced Jesus to death, they learned about the hope of the gospel, 
And this was the crux of Paul's message to these God-fears. But interestingly, Paul doesn't end here. It seems like a good place to end a speech. He shows them the very real need they have for salvation. He had just finished giving them a way to salvation, Jesus. But Paul wants to leave them with a warning. A warning about something that will come to pass sooner than you might think. Verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. There are scoffers. Paul had already seen this prophecy come to pass. He's now warning these people about what's to come to them. There are those who mock God's people, those who will persecute them. And in spite of all that they see, they will not believe. And how do these people respond to Paul's words? They were hungry for more. They waited for these men to come back the next Sabbath to teach them more. It says that they were begging them to come back. People were continuing on with Paul and Barnabas, and they were encouraging them. People who were following them were the Jews and the recent converts to Judaism, people who were born Jewish and Gentiles who had converted. But by the time the next Sabbath comes, it says almost the whole city had gathered to hear the word of the Lord. This would have been a large number of Gentiles. You see, in order to have most of the city gathered, that meant more than just the Jews were there. The population in the city consisted of Galatians, Phrygians, Jews, and Romans, and Greeks. Many speculate that the population of Antioch at this time, population was an estimated 100,000 people. And it's actually a fair estimate. After all, archaeologists have discovered a coliseum there that could host over 15,000 people. I'm not sure how most of the city could have gathered to hear their message, but they knew that there was something important going on. They wanted to catch a glimpse of what was happening. It says that they had gathered to hear the word of the Lord. They were looking to hear what God had to say through these men. And of course, of course, many of the Jews were upset. They were jealous. It says they began to contradict Paul. and They were reviling him. They were speaking things in opposition to Paul. This is what we've seen elsewhere in Acts. When the people were debating the apostles or Stephen, when their words couldn't be proven false, people would respond with their own falsehoods to contradict them, or they would respond with violence. Paul and Barnabas aren't about to be shouted down. They stand up boldly to proclaim God's truth. In verse 46, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Paul says that it was necessary for this message to be spoken to them first. He's addressing the Jews who were opposing him. Just like at Cyprus, Paul came to Antioch and preached the gospel message in the synagogue first. Why did he go to the Jews first? He says by going to them first, he gave them an opportunity to receive the gospel. He wasn't stirring up an opposition to the Jews. Far from it. He brought the gospel to them first. He gave them an opportunity to accept it. This is what Paul wanted. But it says that they had thrust it aside. The language that's used means to reject by pushing it away. It's similar to when you put some sort of nasty mash in front of a baby, and they thrust it aside to the floor. These Jews had treated the gospel with contempt. So Paul's telling them, you didn't seem to want the good news of Jesus. So we took what you rejected, and we brought it to the Gentiles. They have no right to be upset. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, The word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. The Gentiles are overjoyed. They're able to receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. They're rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. That's interesting. Verse 44 says they came to hear the word of the Lord. And once they hear it, they are glorifying it. This doesn't mean that they were worshiping their Bibles. They didn't have Bibles back then. This means that they were in awe of the good news of Jesus. Verse 49 says that the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region. 
The word of the Lord is the story of God's plan. It's his, his salvation message. It had been at work since man was created in the garden, and it was slowly revealed until the coming of Christ. And now it's spreading, it's going out to the nations. Of course their Jewish opponents would not stand for this. They stir up people against the apostles. They begin to persecute them, eventually driving them out of the city. So here we see two different types of people, those who humbly accept the gospel and they receive it with joy, full well knowing that they don't deserve it. And then we see these jealous people, those who think they deserve it. They were upset at the apostles for gaining so many followers. Never do these people listen to reason or to truth. They reject the truth. They would rather shut down the truth than to listen to God, and placing their plans and their pride above Scripture. Even when Paul uses prophecies in Scripture to show that this was all part of God's plan, they reject it to the point of violence. So how do Paul and Barnabas respond? Do they stay and fight? Well, verse 51 says, they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. What on earth is going on? What happened to their courage? Why didn't they stay and fight? We can find some of the answers in the words that are used. It says they shook the dust off from, off from their feet against them. Why are they shaking dust off their feet? And how do you shake dust against somebody? Jesus actually used similar language while talking to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. These are instructions for, do, for what to do when people reject you or your words. Jesus doesn't tell them to fight them or to stay until they are martyred. He tells them to shake off their dust from their sandals when they leave that place. The idea of shaking the dust off your feet is a way of saying, I don't own you anything, not even the dust on my sandals. They didn't have dirt floor and houses at that time. It's a way of physically displaying you aren't accountable for them. These people will be judged, but you did your part. You tried to share the good news of Jesus with them. And if they refuse to accept it, if they refuse to listen, then you're allowed to leave them. There's no need to continue to argue. When you do this, you are leaving them to the judgment of God. So when it says they did this against their opponents, it means they're leaving them to their own condemnation. Paul and Barnabas were leaving them to God's judgment. It's interesting to note that Jesus didn't come up with this idea of shaking the dust off your feet. As was the case with many of the things that Jesus said, he was using something that already existed in their culture at that time. And he put a spin on it. You see, there was a lot of travel in those times. Jews would have to sail to different countries for purposes of trading and their jobs, and not every Jew lived in Israel. Some would travel in from pagan countries. The Jews knew the importance of keeping their holy nation pure. So when the Jews would come to the Holy Land, after being in a pagan nation, they would shake the dust off their feet because they didn't want to defile their land by bringing even the dust in from an unclean place. So when Jesus tells his followers to shake the dust off their feet after people reject the gospel message, he's telling his disciples that such people are acting like pagans. Even like those of Sodom and Gomorrah, they are heaping judgment on themselves. And it's the same with Paul and Barnabas. They had given these people the opportunity to accept the gospel. But to those who are persecuting, they are fit to be judged, just like the enemies of Israel, because now they are the enemies of the gospel. But as for them, Paul and Barnabas, it says, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. There was nothing that could steal their joy because they weren't after the praise of people. They had the joy of the Lord. They had the assurance that they were doing God's will. And that was all that mattered in the end. Church, God is still unfolding his plan. Yes, we have seen the climactic moment where Jesus broke the curse of sin and death at the cross. We know our Savior rose from the dead and he is seated on high, victorious. But what about now? Why didn't Jesus just gather up his followers after him? Why did he leave us here? We read in Romans, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
We are reading in it, how many in Israel have been hard towards the gospel. And Paul has said that this is why they are turning to the Gentiles. This is why the Gentiles are being brought into God's kingdom. We are a part of this movement, this moment in history. We are those who have been brought in, like a branch that's grafted into a plant. We have become a part of God's people. Because the, the work of Jesus on the cross, we are able to find peace with God, oneness with him, because of Christ's work on the cross. So as we go from here, remember that our lives are being lived in a moment. We exist in God's story. This is exciting. If you've ever thought that life was pointless, it's not. We are able to see God's hand at work. It doesn't matter if evil seems to be winning, because we know in the end, all history past, present, and future, it's all in God's hands, and he will be victorious in the end. The only thing that we need to do is to decide what role we play in God's story. He has blessed us with all things. He has set aside good works for us to do. By his strength, according to his grace, we are able to play a part in his story. So go through life with eyes wide open. See God working. And praise him for every battle that's won. When the time comes where you are able to join in his work, step out in faith. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you once again, Lord, that we can trust in you because we know you, God. You've revealed yourself to us. We pray that no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what point in history we find ourselves in, we would praise you, God, with joy because our joy isn't rooted in our circumstances. It's rooted in our hope, God. And our hope is in you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 41, Holy, Holy, Holy. <laughs> 